This rail strike is one of the UK's largest for years, and it's being led by one union. Every worker in this country deserves to negotiate a pay rise and bargain on their conditions. Because if you're not bargaining for a strong trade union, you're begging. The RMT is bargaining on behalf of thousands of workers. They're employed by the companies that operate the trains and by Network Rail, which maintains the infrastructure. And the RMT says it's time for a pay rise. It wants to be clear, this isn't about train drivers. Most of them belong to a different union. This, it says, is for signalers, cleaners and many others, members who are not high earners. For example, train guards earn between 23 and 36,000 pounds, track maintenance workers between 16 and 34,000. To put that in context, the median pay for all employees in the UK was close to 26,000 pounds last year. And the RMT says its members deserve more. Our members haven't had a pay rise for up to three years. So inflation is now 11.1% on the RPI scale. There's two years ahead of that where they've not had a pay deal. They are getting poorer. We should add, in May 2019, the RMT did secure a pay deal for some of its members. As for inflation, it is high. But Boris Johnson says that's a reason to show restraint. If wages continually chase the increase in prices, then we risk a wage price spiral. The FT defines a wage spiral as when workers demand pay rises to match higher living costs and then companies raise prices to protect their margins, to protect their profits. The FT says it repeats a self-fulfilling process. Unions counter this idea, arguing that energy prices are pushing up inflation, not wages. Now that analysis is disputed, but the government accepts that wages, in this case, should rise. No one is suggesting there's some kind of pay freeze required here. We all want to see a sensible pay increase. But of course, there are different definitions of sensible. This is Simon Clarks. Linked to that, we need to see reform of some of the practices that make our railway a very unsustainable entity at the moment. We, ha we have to recognise that uh, the way that our, our rail network operates is not fit for the 2020s. Now, pay proposals have been made. The RMT wants a 7% rise. Network Rail has offered 2% with a further 1% to come. The RMT rejected that. Though it accepts that restructuring is necessary, it adds, we've got to have an assurance that the people who are working there today won't come out of that worse off than they went in. And while the union wants assurances, so too do the train operating companies. Well, we really require details uh, and acceptance that reform can go ahead and then that allows us to then work on how do we get a settlement for our staff. The company says some reform have to be accepted before an offer is made but the RMT has a further concern. They have a plan to cut thousands of jobs off the railway network between network rail and the train operators. We think that that threatens the safety regimes on our railway because they have to cut the maintenance regimes in order to cut the jobs. These safety concerns, though, are not accepted by the employers. We do need to reduce the number of people that work for Network Rail uh, because that's one of the key ways that we can be more efficient and save money. We know we can do that safely. And so we have a government demanding reduced budgets and modernisation, employers seeking to deliver that and unions saying this is neither safe nor fair. And the context is the pandemic. We committed £16 billion pounds to support the railways through COVID. As a result, the trains continued to operate, the industry survived, not a single railway worker had to be furloughed or lost their job, not one. It's true, the government did support the railways through the pandemic. The question is, what should happen now, especially because COVID has changed how we travel? Passenger numbers are down by a fifth, in part because of working from home, fewer journeys... Mean Make it more productive and get the industry of taxpayer-funded life support. To which the RMT argues that Covid's become a smokescreen for job cuts that were planned all along. And though the RMT and the government are trading statements in public, they're not actually directly negotiating. The union is talking to the employers, though it says in reality the Treasury in particular is calling the shots. And the opposition Labour Party says this. Not only are they boycotting the talks, they're actually hobbling them, and therefore that's why it is imperative that they step in. The government denies a boycott, but it is declining to intervene. It's not, it's not the case that we're going to sit round the, the table directly with the trade unions, because that's not how uh, the government ought to be behaving here. We're not the legal employer. To Labour's leader, though, this is a political ploy.
I don't want the strikes to go ahead, but he does. He wants, Mr Speaker, he wants the country to grind to a halt so he can feed off the division. The government denies this too. And there are also questions for Labour. Which party in this dispute are you backing? Well, we're backing a deal. We want to see the dispute avoided, and it can be. My colleague Nick Edley's looked at Labour too. Is it backing the striking rail workers, Nick asks? There's been no definite answer. How much is a fair pay rise, he asks. That's for the negotiations, the party says. And in these negotiations, there are profound tests for the government and its stated commitment to a high-wage economy, for Labour and its relationship with the unions, for the rail employers and their efforts to run a business with changing travel habits, and for the union and the leverage it has to serve its members. Something 